Hi, welcome to Off the Beaten Track. I'm your host, Russ Segner. We put together this series to feature narrow gauge layouts seldom seen because they're not located in cities where we normally visit for national narrow gauge conventions. Thanks to the narrow organizing committee of Pete Smith of St. Louis, Jerry Cornwell of Ontario, Canada, Mark Lachey of Dallas, Texas, Dave Adams of San Jose, California, and Jeff Schultz of State in Oregon. Information on these programs is available at NNG at groups.io. We hope you will join us. And now for our program. I'm Mark Lachey. I'm an SN3 modeler. I live in Dallas, Texas. And uh, Keith Stamper has been a friend of mine for over 20 years. I first met Keith in the late 90s when he and his wife, Claire, came to Texas uh, from the North Country. Keith uh, grew up in South Africa, uh, migrated to Canada, uh, then spent some time in the United States. He has been a longtime model railroader, starting off in HON3, um, went to uh, ON3 uh, during his uh, first foray in Canada. And um, then when he came to the States, he migrated to SN3, the perfect scale, as I continue to remind Keith. Um, and then uh, when he went back to Canada in about 2005, he reverted to the dark side, went back to ON3. Uh, Keith is a, in our group, is known as being a rubber scaler because we never know what scale he's going to build in next. He's always doing something different. But uh, Keith, why don't you unmute yourself? Um, and if you want to get started with your program, uh, on the Colorado and Rio Grande Southern. I got that right. Um, yep. I'll sit back and, and watch your video and listen, okay? Yep. Well, hello guys. Uh, as Mark just said, I'm Keith Stamper and a uh, long time model railroader. I, uh, I currently reside in the small community of Port Colborne, Ontario, which is on the right near Niagara Falls. Um, I retired in 2016 and my wife Claire and I moved here and uh, decided to start on a new layout. During my working career, I moved around quite a bit and tried to build layouts and every time we got organized and got a layout done, I had to move again. So this layout was started when I retired and my first year of retirement was a full-time job. I got up every morning and I came to the basement and I worked on the layout. So without saying much more than that, I uh, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Um, let's have a look and see what I've managed to create so far. It's very much a work in process. So welcome to my railroad, guys. As I say, I, I'm playing upon words here, Colorado and Rio Grande Southern Railroad. Um, I have a, a great love of the Colorado and Southern equipment, but I also like the Rio Grande Southern. So I decided to kind of amalgamate them into one railroad. I have a great interest in uh, modeling, but I also have an interest in operating. So when I designed this layout, I built it for operations. So some little, some notes. Brief history. As I said, I've always enjoyed the art of model building. My model railroad is an narrow gauge layout set in Colorado somewhere around 1935. I enjoy Colorado and Rio Grande Southern equipment and motive power. My decision to amalgamate both railroads into one operational system prompted me to build the layout you're going to visit today. A what if scenario allows for the interchange of CNS and RGS equipment as was feasible. I enjoy operation and design elements incorporate point to point ops to keep about six people busy. <clears throat> Construction. This layout had to fit into a 42 by 12 foot six room in my basement. The yards are built on high grade plywood and benchwork is all open grid. The roadbed between yards is spline, which I cut on my table saw from number one grade pine. There are no inaccessible areas. I'm just not getting any younger. No track power. The layout is totally power on board. There is known as dead rail. Um, all the track is hand laid on individual wood ties, code 70 and code 83 weathered rail. And all the turnouts are controlled by tortoise switch machines with toggle switches recessed into the fascia. Equipment and structures. 
My locomotives are all brass imports. Uh, DCC power is supplied by Tsunami Dakotas with a CVP air wire system. That's known as power on board. I reworked most of the motive power by re-gearing some locomotives and installing new motors. I paint all my locomotives and weather them to my taste. Rolling stock's a combination of several manufacturers' kits with a few scratch-built cars. Structures are mostly structures from several manufacturers. Archuleta Depot, as it's called, is a scratch-built structure, along with a few stock pens and a coal dock. Vehicles are a combination of 148th scale white metal kits and some 143rd thrown in here and there. So, operations. There are three towns or major switching operations along the way. The most prominent town is the railroad's headquarters. I call it Archuleta, a fictitious town in my world. Westbound trains are made up here. Heading west, the first stop is Argo, a well-known Colorado landmark on the CNSRR. Further west, the next stop is Eagle, which is the midpoint of the railroad. And at Eagle, there's a mine, a stock pen, and an LCL track. Continuing west, the next point of interest is the Forks Creek area with the Y and bridges. And finally, we reach the town in the center of the room, which I call Pitkin. Much switching and uh, operations available at the brewery and the stock chute, Conoco, Tinsmith, Bull Durham, LCL, Lumber, and a few other spots. All car movements on my layout are generated using switch list on a Mac computer. As you walk into the room, this is what you see. You see you're standing in the doorway, basically looking to the right. And in the foreground is the area known as Forks Creek and beneath the clock is the town of Eagle. Um, on the wall on the left hand side or in the far corner, you can see a cut of stock cars and that's the stock pens at Eagle. But we'll move around the layout. Standing at the far end of the room, you can see the door on the right and you can see the roundhouse. The roundhouse is Como Depot, a Como roundhouse built from a, from a kit. Um, again, a nice structure to put on a layout, especially being a CNS prototype. The, uh, the bench work, as I said, is plywood and the railing is to keep people's pesky fingers and elbows off the layout. Standing at the opposite end of the room, you look towards the, the end where I was just standing with the camera and you can see the back of the Como roundhouse. The door is on the left. That white switch you see in the fascia directly beneath the Como Depot, a roundhouse, is next to a drawer. And inside that drawer, I have a battery charger for recharging my locomotives. I'll explain a little more about that as time goes by through this presentation. So here's a track plan. Um, it's the building is to scale and the, the track was drawn in by hand and then I painted over it with a brush. At the bottom here is the doorway where we enter the room. Forks Creek is on the right. You have the Como area, Como roundhouse area, and then you have the town of Archuleta. And then the main line heads around to Argo, up through Eagle, and into all the Y, and then down the center of the room to Pitkin. And this keeps six people pretty busy. Normally we operate with four people, two crews, a brakeman and an engineer. So here we see the roundhouse area. Um, you can see the uh, Como, Deep, uh, Como roundhouse. I keep calling it depot, I don't know why. <laughs> but anyway, it's the Como roundhouse. And uh, number 22 sitting there being serviced. One of the scratch build structures that I have on my layout is this small coal platform. I uh, socialized with a group of model railroaders this in, the area, in this area and one of the fellows enjoys building structures and he asked me if he could scratch build uh, something for my layout. So I made a sketch and he assembled this for me. These two wires here are of interest. This is how I charge my locos. I bring the locomotive up to this point and in the water hatch I have a plug. I simply put those two wires into the plug, go around, open that drawer, turn on that switch and hit on and the locomotive charges for about two hours. One of the things about this photograph is interesting. Photographs always give you the opportunity to see what you could do better or what you could do differently. And in this picture particularly, I was asked to leave it for a reason. I'm sure you can all see there's a glaring example of something that's wrong. And that's that the guy next to the green pickup trucks lying on his back. He's probably drunk, but anyway. That's one of the reasons why that picture was left in there, so you could get an idea. 
I paint my own backdrops. I'm not an artist, but uh, working with uh, some sketches and some pictures and a little help and encouragement from my wife, Claire, we've managed to accomplish something that's feasible, I think. Here we see the interior of the roundhouse. All these locomotives I've recently painted. I, I did them in batches. In fact, I painted uh, two at a time. Yes, I take them apart, put them parts in the box, and then I paint each part and put the locos back together again, installing the battery and everything else that makes them run. Here we see the engine, the engine facility from a different, different angle. And the track on the right is actually the interchange track on my layout. And it also goes to a lift out across the door, which allows me, if I so wish, to run continuously. I've embedded a few small videos in here just to give you an idea. We'll see how well they play. One of the things I've done with my layout and uh, control is I uh, using the throttles, I've set them up to give a uh, fairly realistic and prototypical operation. I'm a great uh, one and I like my locomotives to run extremely smoothly and not to uh, hesitate. Um, I've set my throttles up to use the braking function. So basically the engineers get to run the locomotive by using the throttle, the brake and the direction, which is prototypically correct. So it gives for a nice realistic operation and also using the new tsunamis with the cylinder cocks open you can cause have the locomotive ease on and off the turntable very realistically. The guy in the foreground here is taking a picture of uh, number 71 as she calls up ready for a day's run. Here you see on the right hand side the town of Archuleta. As I mentioned I started this layout in 2016 and uh, it's a work in progress in many areas. Um, I'm scenicing it and putting in as much detail as I can as time goes, goes by. But the town is on the right. All these little white switches you see mounted in the fascia are double pole, double throw switches, which allow the operators to throw the turnouts adjacent to the area they're working. This makes for a very realistic and easy operation on the crew. Nobody's reaching over anybody to try and uh, throw a turnout. I mentioned that I'd scratch built a structure for my depot, uh, for the depot, and this is it. This is the little uh, Archuleta depot that I built. Um, some of you may remember many, many years ago, there was a company called San Juan and they made model buildings. I think it was called San Juan. But anyway, they made model structures. The coaling, the famous coaling tower that was around was done by these people. Well, this wood actually came from um, the structure that I use, the wood that I use for the structure came from that, uh, from one of their engine house kits. Um, I, I met the owner of that company at one of the module meets and uh, he kindly offered to give me some of his kits, which I've had over the years and built. The signs on the, uh, the depots, such as Archuleta and the elevation and the train orders board, I made those up on my computer and then just printed them. I like to uh, paint my figures as well and uh, enjoy the, the time spent and trying to make them look as realistic as possible. The two uh, gentlemen waiting for the train there with uh, their waistcoats and beards are uh, probably going on a business trip somewhere. Looking down on Archuleta, you can see how at the top end of the layout in the corner on the left, there's scenery and ground cover and I'm working my way towards the right there will be a street scene along the back and towards the wall. Track, as I mentioned, is all hand laid and most of my turnouts are about number eight. I build them to fit the location. I don't use a jig of any sort. I just build them where they need to be, being mindful of the radius, not to make them sharp. I uh, think nothing detracts more on a layout than having extremely sharp turnouts where a locomotive can barely ease through them. Here you see a typical kit uh, structure. This is the warehouse at Archuleta. Generates a lot of traffic here and uh, it was a structure that I assembled from a, a resin uh, type kit. This is the Archuleta grocery store. Um, it's actually the uh, 
uh, it's actually a structure that uh, was produced, I believe, by Arkansas Valley Models or Arkansas Valley Models, however you want to pronounce it. Um, I, uh, I built part of it and my friend uh, Ross built some of the parts for me and it, we ended up with this pretty representative structure of a small town grocery store and gas station. Here's a closer view of it. Um, it's made out of a uh, um, urethane type material and it was extremely difficult to glue this together or attach the parts. And uh, it actually had to be redone a few times to get all the pieces to actually line up. It was very difficult. This is a structure that's not well known to most people and it fits my layout because as I said, it's a fictitious layout and I enjoy operations. And this is a, this is a structure called the Never Peel Paint Company. Um, it's a kit and uh, it, it's a type of kit that fits perfectly in the back corner of a room where you can have a lot of switching operations and you can have uh, a lot of opportunities to, to detail things. I, um, I, I found this to be the perfect uh, kit for this area. Here we see uh, number 60. This is one of the locos I recently painted and weathered. Um, I use uh, scale coat paint on my locomotives and uh, I weather them with a combination of washes and uh, uh, pan pastels. Um, I don't handle my locomotives too often but I do obviously have to, if, if one of them stops out on the main line because the battery's depleted, then I have to pick it up. But I've got a routine where I recharge my batteries after running my locomotives. So now, most of the time my engines are always fully charged. One of the things about having power on board is you have to be vigilant about keeping your locomotives charged. The, the cab curtains were actually uh, my wife's idea. She said to me, why don't you use craft paper and uh, using this brown craft paper, you can actually create some fairly realistic cab curtains and they fold nicely into a fan fold. I mentioned about the cars. This is one of the 148th, 143rd vehicles on the layout and I believe this truck is 150th. As long as they're not too close together, they look okay. But if the car were parked right next to the truck, it wouldn't be a good idea because they would be, the scale would be so dissimilar. This is my caboose service track. Um, it's currently under development. The coal bin and the toolbox is there. The fellow with his back to us is servicing the cabooses. He's um, loading coal into the, into the stoves and getting things ready for runs. I've got five of these uh, uh, Colorado and Southern type cabooses or cabooses, however you want to pronounce it, on my layout. Another thing about this photograph is of interest again you can take a photograph of your layout and it'll point out areas that you need to look at. If you look at this, you can see the shiny spots here. That's when I made, when I built the turnouts, obviously I had to file the rail and uh, clean the black off the rail. This is the main line heading out of town. The curve to the right goes up to Argo and this is the foundry area. This is a Mount Albert scale lumber kit known as the Stanley Storage Company, which has been converted to a foundry. This building on the right is a well-known kit. It's called Buckmaster's Radiator Repair Shop. This young fellow here with a beer in his hand is actually having a chat with the proprietor here about getting his truck fixed. I think he's got a hole in the radiator. And this picture is the front of the radiator shop. And uh, this fellow has just, left the, uh, has just left the foundry and he's stopped for gas. And he's talking to this guy who's a gas, gas jockey here. And he says, I can't believe the price of gas. It's 18 cents a gallon. Are you mad? How expensive does gas get? Here's a front view of the foundry. And again, taking 143rd vehicles, you can modify them slightly to make them look more realistic. One of the things with these vehicles is that if you buy them off the shelf, you'll notice the wheels are normally right on the edge of the fenders. And that's not very realistic. Um, if you look at an older vehicle, especially one for something like this, you'll notice the wheels are actually under the fender, not on the edge. And uh, I have cut the axles on these vehicles and I've modified them and weathered the tires, etc. This boiler house here is actually off uh, uh, one of our group members up here in Canada. I'm a member of the Maple Leaf Modelers or Maple Leaf Mafia as some people call us. We are a long-time group of modelers in the Toronto area 
consisting of about 20 people. We uh, have regular meets and uh, support one another in our modeling endeavors. I think there's a few members on the, on the, uh, on the um, WebEx tonight, on the webinar, I should say. So here we come to Argo. Now, as most people that have been to Colorado have seen Argo, it's a pretty imposing structure and it takes up an awful lot of room. And I, I thought, well, I wanted to have something that represented Argo. So what I did is I purchased a photograph and uh, one of the fellows that uh, lives in this area, Lex, I think he's on this uh, webinar tonight, kindly produced the photograph for me in a printout. And then I cut the photograph out and attached it to foam core board. On the prototype, this part of the building with the peaked roof here is about 200 feet long. And I had to compress this all to fit in a small area. On the left here is where the Auburns will go. I plan on building the Auburns and having a, a representation of them here. This picture shows two boxcars standing at the Argo mill offloading. What I wanted to make mention of here is these two cars are both ready to run cars and you can take a ready to run car such as this one on the left and you can weather it to look like this. These are two different manufacturers, but that's irrelevant. What you can do though is by weathering a car, you can create a very realistic representation of the prototype. To me, this looks like a toy. And to me, this looks far more realistic. I am in the process of replacing all the wheels on my cars. I've switched all of them to Grantline wheels. Uh, some of the cars I purchased had uh, other manufacturers wheels. And I noticed when I measured them with a, with a vernier, some were 110 thousandths of an inch wide and some were 115. And I was wondering why I was having derailments and I realized it's not my poor track work, it's my wheels. Scenery. Scenery on my layout is a combination of hard shell, rock castings and uh, play sand. I buy play sand from the local hardware store or from a store that sells this. And then I use a sieve to, to uh, collect various textures and put them onto the layout. I wet them down with uh, uh, wet water, which is a combination of glue and, uh, sorry, dishing, dishwashing detergent and uh, water and then uh, soak it in glue and it glues down pretty good. Grass, of course, is static grass. You'll see a train run by here. It might be a little, uh, little jerky because I filmed it a very long time ago. There again, you can see the box cars are weathered makes a huge difference in the appearance of the train. So now we've reached the town of Eagle. Town of Eagle is the midpoint of my layout and it's a very interesting place. There's been more arguments in this area between crews than anywhere else because everybody wants to occupy the main line at the same time. So I've introduced a token system now so we don't have any cornfield meets. I, uh, had several instances when we were operating here where two trains would meet head on on the main line at Argo and uh, there'd be a big problem when one train would always be backing up. So now trains cannot proceed east without picking up the token here from the, from the train coming down the main line from Pitkin. This Eagle, Eagle Depot is actually the Forks Creek Depot. Um, I modified the roof and I changed the fascia boards on it, but it's a, basically this, the, the uh, Forks Creek Depot. Again, the scenery here is the basic ground cover. It's just dirt right now glued on and it will be scenic in as time goes by. Um, I, as I said earlier at the start of this, I've been at this for four years now, coming on five and it's a very long and arduous progress, process. Here we see the train, a train passing Eagle on its way back. I did mention that I had re-geared some locomotives. At number 71, I replaced the gearbox in it, took the wheels off the axles and uh, put on a new gear set and uh, made the locomotive run quite well. It unfortunately broke down on me. The worm gear was so badly worn on it that it wouldn't run anymore. In the background, we have the stock pens at Eagle. 
I want to say a little bit about the stock pens. Um, there were a, a kit that was produced by our friend, I believe at Crystal River, and um, really worth the effort to build that uh, kit uh, from uh, what is supplied in the box. I added a few more bits and pieces to it to give it a little bit more detail. You can see here the, the shoots. I stained and colored the wood on, the, on this by going to a fellow that I met in the town I used to live in before I retired. He had a saddle shop and I asked him if he would be so kind as to sell me some dye that he used for saddles. And he said, oh, how much do you want? And I said, just a small quantity, maybe you know a couple of ounces. And he said, here's a bottle, have it. So that's what I used. I diluted it with uh, alcohol and I washed it onto the wood and then using steel wool, I, uh, I, roughed the, I wiped the wood to get this worn appearance. The, the horse and man, the men on the layout in, in this area particularly are all Aspen model figures. Um, I can't recommend them enough, they're wonderful. They make great detail and you can do uh, so much with them with a paintbrush. All the sheep on the layout are uh, white metal castings and uh, each, each one of those sheep has about nine coats of paint on it. I primed them and painted them with various tones of whites and um, uh, raw colors and then I, I used pan pastels to get them. But the, no two sheep are actually the same. They all look like sheep but they're different. This is the mine at Eagle. This is a, this is a new acquisition. Um, one of our group members unfortunately had to dismantle his layout and I was planning on building a mine in this area and having a tipple and um, he was kind enough to uh, allow me to purchase this from his uh, his layout. So it's actually a very new, I just put it on the layout for to get it in this area but the plan is to have it scenic in and uh, use it as a as a coal mine. As I said at the beginning of this, I cut my spline from uh, number one pine. This is the spline for the main line. I cut miles of it literally on the uh, table saw in my garage. And I think the ratio of sawdust to wood is about 50-50. You end up with so much sawdust. But in the end, it was worth it because you have quality material. And when I build my spline, I, I laminate 13 pieces, putting the centerpiece in first and then six pieces on each side. I do not use spaces. Um, on top of the spline, I place cork. But prior to placing the cork, I plane the spline with a planer, and then I sand it with the palm sander. Here you can see the area known as uh, Forks Creek under construction. You can see the spline and then the cork on top of the spline with the, with the ballast in, and then the rail laid on top of that. As I said, I hand lay all my tracks, so I spike it down approximately every five ties. The, um, the lattice here for the scenery was actually a fortuitous find as well. A friend of ours in the group has an air, had an air conditioning company and he used these very nice clean cardboard sheets to package or receive uh, packaged air conditioning equipment. I was fortunate to have them and I stacked them in piles of about six or eight sheets thick. And again, I ran them through the trusty, trusty table saw. I thoroughly recommend you wear a mask if you do this. You will be covered in dust. Rock cast castings are on my layout. There's hundreds of them and uh, friends in the group were kind enough to bring their castings and loan them to me and uh, our group has a, a large box of castings that sort of do the rounds within the group and uh, I spent a lot of time here. There's about 300 pounds of plaster on my layout and it's not that big the layout but the plaster is extremely heavy and Lord forbid we ever have to move out of this house, but we don't plan on it. The castings, as you can see here, I've applied some castings, they've dried, and then I've applied more castings over that to blend them together. And then I use a spray bottle and a toothbrush to, to blend the rock work. And uh, this is what you end up with. Um, again, in this scene, I'm standing in the aisle looking towards the Forks Creek area. The door is on my right. Bridges in that, on, on this layout, to me a bridge is, I build bridges on my layout and have built bridges for this layout to be nothing more than scenic elements. They're not competition models. I don't spend hours adding every last finite detail to them. I want them to perform a function and that is to be part of my scenery. 
Um, you can see the chunks of spline that I've cut out from the uh, roadbed to create the curvature for the bridge. And then I formed the bridge from styrene, building the towers from that uh, HO uh, plastic that's available and putting in brass rods and turnbuckles to give it that appearance. Um, the idea for this bridge, the curved bridge, of course, is taken uh, from the bridge at uh, Georgetown Loop. And this bridge is a uh, typical truss bridge that you would see somewhere around Forks Creek on the CNS. I also embossed my styrene with rivets to create the steel strapping that you see on this bridge here. And then you can see the color in the rock work at the back it blends very nicely with the foreground scenery to give a, an overall appearance. Looking at the bridge from this angle, you see the turnout that forms part of the Y. This piece goes across the door and actually goes to that uh, interchange track I mentioned earlier. And here you see the uh, truss bridge in place. This is the other half of the Y, the other section of the Y, I should say. One of the most recent additions to my layout has been the pouring of water. Um, we've used Envirotex on the layout, or I have used Envirotex on the layout. And then once I poured it, we do two, did two pours, and then I used Mod Podge to create the ripple effect. You can see it quite clearly here. And this area in the center, which is actually under the truss bridge, will have weeds and grass on it. To create the look of water that's flowing rapidly, the, I used uh, the Mod Podge on top of the Envirotex, and then I used caulking and drew, drew beads of caulking along across the surface. And once dry brushed with white, it creates a fairly realistic looking uh, water effect. Here, as you see number 60 crossing the curved bridge, you can see the water beneath there flowing quite rapidly through the, through the gorge. Again, looking at the, you can see from the door, when you enter the room, you would see the bridge from that side. You can see the water forming through there. Under the, under the bridge here, the water is flowing less quickly and is more, um, more um, smooth on the, on the surface. This is the town of Pitkin. This is the center of the layout or the center of the room, I should say, the end of the layout. And again, there's a small stock, stock pen or stock chute here. I have two turntables on my layout, one at, at, the, at the Como Roundhouse or at Archuleta and this turntable. Both of them are completely scratch built. I uh, use a router to cut a hole in the, in the plywood and I have built them to, the, the bridge actually rides on the ring rail. You can lift it off. It's just sitting on a square block of wood in the center. The, uh, the bridge and turntable at the uh, Roundhouse is powered. I have a Switchmaster turnout motor underneath it with a large disc, giving me a huge gear ratio and it runs and turns extremely smoothly and it's very easy to align the track by eye. I used to have an automatic alignment tool uh, device where you could program it and I got frustrated with it because it was always going out of alignment. So I switched to this and I've never looked back. This is the gas station and tire dealership in the town of Pitkin, an area that I've begun working on scenery. Got two guys here working on the old jalopy that's up on the ramp here. Uh, I think he's getting a wheel or brake job done on it. I, I enjoy doing this kind of scenery on my layout, but again, it's to me, it's all a means to an end and that's to be able to operate the layout. I like to run the trains and operate them with friends and if you can't do that, and I'm sure this will segue into what Dave Adams is going to talk about, um, you, you build a layout, it's wonderful to look at, but if you can't operate it and run it and enjoy it, it kind of gets boring. This is another structure on the layout that's a recent addition. I'm working on putting a, putting a town scene together and gathering structures and building structures to create a street scene. These structures are just sitting on the, on the main uh, surface of the layout and will be actually embedded in the layout. I scenic my structures right into the layout. I, uh, I know some people say, oh, you shouldn't do that because one day when you're not around anymore, somebody may want that structure. Well, they can take it if they can get it off the layout. Here we see the back of the main street at Pitkin. This is the Bull Durham building. These are buildings from um, downtown Deco. They make great structures for this kind of scene. I want this. I want to be able to switch cars at the back of these industries. 
on my operating scheme, I have industries uh, such as the Bull Durham, and behind that, the Tinsmith that receive a lot of material. Stock pen and stock cars, RGS cars, as I say, are brought in from the interchange track and switched on various tracks to, to deliver stock to these pens. In this scene, we're looking across the turntable, and there you can see Archer Ladder on the far side. This is the aisleway. This is the back of the Bull Durham building and the Tinsmith. A busy scene here at Pitkin. Number 71 is actually running up the lead to cut, cut through the crossover and, and work the, um, the track here, which is the, which is the Conoco dealership. This track here with the caboose of standing is the lead to the brewery, the Coors Brewery. And this mainline track that's where the Gons are standing and the crossover here leads to the runaround track where I have a, a lumber facility and the stock chute. Oh, I, I, I wanted to mention, you probably noticed that uh, the, the, you can see it here. You can see the scenery here. This is the base scenery. I will backfill this with dirt and grass and weeds. But I, I believe if you put down this dirt and create the surface, it gives your scenery something to, to adhere to. Okay, so that ends my slideshow. And this is a five minute video of my layout. What I did is I made several run bys with trains in various areas and I put them all together into a video. They're in no real form, but sit back and enjoy. I hope you can watch this.
Well, there you have it, guys. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, there's a few comments and uh, questions that came in. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after we finish that, if people want to press their space bar, but um, your comment about the San Juan engineering structure or kit, uh, Chris Lane Sr., Tom Sullivan, both uh, commented that San Juan engineering based out of New Jersey, mm -hmm. Tom said it was owned by a Don Brown. Correct. Um, That's correct. And then uh, Mike Condor, uh, his comment uh, on your Crystal River stock pin. And of course, Dave Adams popped up on this earlier today that Crystal River is back in business with a new owner. Uh, and they're looking for people to recommend which kits to reissue in which order. Uh, and the stock pin kit is one of the candidates. And then a question, Keith, from a Bruce uh, Bowie. How did you emboss the rivets uh, that you show on the uh, plate girder bridge? Could you respond to that? Yes, I can. I bought a, uh, a rivet embossing tool from Northwest Shortline. And I just simply held the strip, I held the, the rivet uh, embossing tool in my, pin, in my uh, workbench vise and very carefully pressed the tool over it and punched each rivet into it. It was actually very easy to do. <laughs> it, it was a little bit tedious but I, I wanted that rivet effect on the edge of the bridge. Uh, Keith, uh, this is Alex Brinkoff. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, your dead rail uh, powering of your local locomotives. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I decided to switch to dead rail about five years ago and I decided to I looked around at all the different systems that were available then, and they, they were few and far between, but the, the most uh, prolific system that's been around for a long, long time is uh, the CVP air wire system, which was designed primarily for large scale, for G scale. And um, they, over the years, have managed to reduce the size of some of the components. But basically what it consists of is you have the receiver device which has an antenna on it. It's called a converter. And uh, connected to the converter is a small circuit board which is, a, was, which is the central brain of the system. You connect uh, basically eight wires to it. And the eight wires are two for the battery, two for the charger, two for the on off switch and two for the outlet. The outlet goes to that converter device I just mentioned. And from the converter device you have a red and a black wire which is basically your, your rail, your wires for your rail. And they go through a plug. The, the um, decoder is a tsunami, is inside the boiler along with the speaker. I've set it up so that I can disconnect the tender on my locos. And using that same plug, I can plug the locomotive into two wires that I have connected to my NCE uh, d uh, system here. And I can program my engines on the workbench, have them running perfectly then just put them on the layout and run them. And by using Dakota Pro, I save all the programs, or all the settings, and I can go back in and just dump them back in again. It's, it, I, I cannot recommend that enough. The dead rail system has worked so well for me. Um, I, I actually do clean my track still because I like the top of the rails to look shiny. But there's, zero, the only, there's only two wires under my layout, and that's the, the wires for the turnout machines, the power. So it's uh it's been uh it's been very successful for me. Uh Keith, I was going to add to that there are two systems that are currently in use uh that uh, are equivalent to the air wire. One is uh, Pete Steinmetz and Tam Valley's uh dead rail system uh and you can get to that by going to uh, uh dead rails. I think it's deadrails.com. Uh and it works with the existing Digitrack system. Mm -hmm. And I believe it works with NCE also. Yes, and it's, I... it simply uses your existing old DCC system and just mm -hmm. adds a, a radio transmission capability to it. Right. And, it's, uh, I actually and, know Pete Steinmetz quite well. And yeah. uh, I have purchased uh, several batteries from him. In fact, all my batteries were, were uh, produced by Pete. 
the reason why I, I, I know that's recent, that's a recent uh, development that Pete's come up with, but remember my layout's not wired. So there's no DCC on it. <laughs> so I know that the Stanton system also worked uh, quite well, but you had to have a DCC installed layout for it to piggyback on. Whereas the system's totally independent. We may come back to uh, visit dead rail at some point I can do a uh, clinic on it if you like. We well, I, yeah, as later in, in, in the spring, <laughs> there are going to be a lot of guys out in the in the backyard working on outdoor layouts. <laughs> what is okay. the third system? There Sorry? was a third system mentioned that I didn't hear. Oh, there's the uh, Pete Steinmetz has the system known as Dead Rail Installs. Then there's Tam Valley. And then there's also the Stanton system, which I believe is still out there and it's sold through Northwest Short Line. But you have to have an existing layout with a DCC system and wiring for that to work. Got it. I built this layout completely. My track works are dead short. All my tie bars and uh, in my turnouts are brass. <laughs> All right, well, Keith, thank you very much. You're very uh, welcome. We appreciate it. This was a great way to start. We hope you enjoyed this. We look forward to seeing you again. The next session will be posted on the group's IONNG several days before the next program. Look for the link there.